It's a great pleasure for Jill, my wife, and I to be with you for this Easter weekend. Thank you very much indeed for inviting us. Having said that, I fully realize most of you did not invite us. Well, thank you anyway. <laughs> it's a genuine joy for us to be here in Ottawa this Easter weekend. I, I do remember being uh, at the Met in Ottawa many years ago, but it was not in this building. And uh, it was downtown in a much older building, and this is magnificent. And uh, I congratulate you in uh, putting together this kind of facility I wish you well in your ministry here and trust that this place will become known as a house of prayer. I tr trust that it will become known as a place where God's people gather and a place from which God's people scatter in the fullness of the blessing of the gathering in order that they might make a profound impact on this crucial city in the nation of Canada. So it's our joy to share with you uh, today. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to Scripture, and in particular to Romans chapter 5. I, I propose reading the first 11 verses of Romans chapter 5. One of the instructions that the Apostle Paul gave to his young protege, Timothy, uh, was, don't, whatever you do, don't neglect the public reading of Scripture. And uh, my observation in many of our churches, uh, in, in many different parts of the Western world particularly, are tending to do that. And, and I think that's a mistake. When uh, I've talked to uh, leaders uh, of worship, in churches where they don't spend time in the public reading of Scripture, they said, well, that was for days when people were fundamentally biblically illiterate. And I say, well, that's precisely why we need it uh, now. Because, quite frankly, many people know many arguments against Scriptures. They don't know why the Scriptures are not relevant today. Uh, amazing. This is amazing in that they usually haven't read them. And it would seem to me that if people are not reading the Scriptures, then perhaps we should make sure that we read the Scriptures to them. All that to give you time to find the place. All right. <laughs> Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance, Perseverance, character, character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, some might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Now, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? 
And not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now may God give us insight into his word, and may we go away into the weekend rejoicing in what God has revealed to us in his scriptures. Now, um, as my grandchildren say to me with, with great enthusiasm, Papa has been around the block a few times, and that is patently obvious. And I point out to them, yes, but hundreds of years ago, I was your age. And <laughs> clearly, there has been a long intervening period from when I was young to where I am now in my state of Egypt. I was asked to speak recently to a group of men in our home church, and the topic they gave me was aging. <laughs> Can you believe that? Aging. And the introduction they gave was very straightforward. We've asked Stuart to come and speak to us today on the subject of aging. We can think of no one better qualified <laughs> to do it. And so I had the embarrassment of contradicting the chairman of saying, I am not aging, I am a Jed. <laughs> it, it already happened. Okay, all that. All that to say that the, the idea in Scripture clearly uh, when, when it uses the word elder, that is somebody who has oversight in a community in general or a church in particular, elder is clearly related to older. And the idea is that as time goes on, you get older and hopefully you acquire experience and in acquiring experience, you finish up with wisdom. That's how it's supposed to work. Now here, my grandchildren have some opinions as far as I am concerned. They know I am aged. They know that I've gone around the block a few times. They know that uh, I have had all kinds of experiences. Whether I have accumulated wisdom or not is still a question open to discussion. But I think I have learned something. I have learned that whilst in my younger days I thoroughly enjoyed debating and arguing, I have concluded with this accumulated wisdom now that arguing usually is counterproductive. Not only does it not produce what you hope to produce, it often produces the opposite of what you hope to produce, counterproductive. Um, and so, uh, I, I've, I've given a lot of thought to this. For instance, if you have an argument, you can win it or lose it. You see, if you win the argument, what happens? Well, the person who you've beaten in the argument is humil humiliated. Uh, they feel stupid. Uh, they may even feel intimidated. But one thing is certain, they'll keep out of your way. So you've won an argument and lost the relationship. Counterproductive. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, you may lose the argument, in which case the person who beat you in the argument is going to say, what a dummy he is. Why in the world did I waste all that time talking to him? He is as thick as two short planks. What is the good of talking to a person like that? I'm not going to waste any more time, and so he disappears too. What's happened? You've lost an argument, and you've lost a relationship as well. So... Here's what I have concluded. I'm going to try to do something infinitely harder than having an argument. And that is trying to find points of agreement. Trying to find points of agreement. Now, Jill and I have the privilege of traveling all over the world. We've been on every continent. And on every continent, with the exception of Antarctica, we've been there too. But as far as evangelism is concerned, very, very disappointing indeed. <laughs> <coughs> Penguins are, I think they're atheists. Anyway, <laughs> there, there, there was no warmth there towards the message at all. 
on every continent, we have found a point of agreement. And I'm sure you're all on the front edge of your seats now in anticipation. Oh, I'd love to know what that is. Well, if you're really very good and quiet, I will tell you at the end of this, <laughs> of this talk. No, I'll tell you now. The point of agreement that I have concluded is this. Things are not the way they ought to be. Now, just introduce that into a boring conversation sometime. And I promise you, it won't be boring for long. There will be no disagreement. You will very, very quickly find not only that people will nod their heads wisely and say, that's right, things are not the way they ought to be. They will then give you illustrations from their personal experience, to which you will respond by giving more illustrations from your personal experience. And in the end, there will be a resounding agreement, something very, very unusual in this fractured world of ours, a point of general agreement. But then the question is, now where do we go? So we're all agreed here. Things are not the way they ought to be. Well, this is where you can go. You can say, you know, I was just thinking, if things are not the way they ought to be, does that not presuppose there is a way things ought to be? And then say, oh, never thought about that. And if we agree that assuming that, that assuming that there is the way things ought to be precedes concluding things are not the way they ought to be, then the obvious question that's going to come up then is how did we get from the way things ought to be to uh, the way things are now? How do we get here? <laughs> Before long, you begin to discover that some people that you were talking to are actually doing theology. They would be horrified if they realize that's what it is. But when we start to think in terms of the way things are and the way things ought to be, we're thinking about origins. And we, we've only got two options. The, the two options are either, I believe that God is and that he created the heavens and the earth, or I believe that God isn't and he didn't create the heavens and the earth. That's where you start. One of the two options. Everybody you'll meet started somewhere with one of those two faith presuppositions. I believe that God is and that he created the heavens and the earth, or I believe that God isn't and he didn't create the heavens and the earth. Somehow or other, it got here. No idea how. All right. Now, if I look at the situation and we're agreed, things are not the way they ought to be, and I say to myself, that assumes there is a way things ought to be, and a good way of looking at the, fact, the way things ought to be is, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, had a look at what he made, pronounced it good, and guess what? Things were the way they ought to be. Now look at this. Not only do we conclude things are not the way they ought to be, if we're honest, we'll say nothing is the way it ought to be. Everything seems to have a twist, a faint. Everything, every, everything seems to have a, a warp to it. Nothing is actually the way it appears to be. We hear something that sounds really great and immediately say, what's the catch? We know nothing is the way it ought to be, which now it gets personal. If nothing is the way it ought to be, that means I, as part of the created order, am not the way I ought to be. And forgive me, neither are you. And if that is true, nothing about me is the way it ought to be. My body isn't the way it ought to be. That's why we have doctors. My mind isn't the way it ought to be because, quite frankly, I get hold of the wrong end of the stick quite frequently. And what I don't know would fill a library. Actually, my emotions are not the way they ought to be because they get bent out of shape far too quickly. My will is not the way it ought to be because, frankly, I make some bad decisions. So do you. Nothing is the way it ought to be. I am not 
the way I ought to be. That's why things are not the way they ought to be. But there was a way things ought to be, and God created it. So we've got a real problem here. If it is true that there was a way things ought to be, that was creation, and things are not the way they ought to be, that's what we call fall, then the big question is, if God created all things the way they ought to be, and they aren't the way they ought to be, including me, nothing about me being the way it ought to be, what is God's attitude to me right now? What is it? I need to think about that. If I start thinking about that and start thinking about who God is, I begin to say to myself, you know, if, if, God, <laughs> if God is the origin of all things, there's no question about it that this world that is not the way that it ought to be is still incredibly beautiful. It is breathtakingly magnificent. You look into the expanses of space and we now find that the Hubble telescope that has revealed to us things we never imagined is totally obsolete. And now they've got a real one. And we say to ourselves, what is it going to reveal? And it is going to reveal to us a majestic, orderly, creative, incredibly powerful creator of all things. But if I go the other way, and I begin to look into the intricacies of the atom. I begin to discover all that is involved down there, and I don't even know the words for all that is to be involved inside the most minuscule part of the created order. What do I see? I see the wonders of who God is. But then I look at human beings, I look at human beings who are not only part of the created order, they are the pinnacle of the created order. And I see people of incredible creativity. I listen to some music and I say, how could somebody imagine that? How could somebody hear that inside their head? I, I read literature and I say, how could anybody speak so magnificently it touches my soul? I look at buildings that go up and I say, how in the world could an architect imagine all that and put it all together? And I see the creativity and the beauty and the wonder of humanity. And I say, this God who is the origin of all these things is incredible. And then I think of human beings and I see how they have an innate sense of right and wrong. Every, every human being has an innate sense of right and wrong. <laughs> have, you, have you ever seen little kids playing? And they'll play very, very happily for two or three minutes. And then suddenly there'll be howls and screams and some little fellow will come running in, his face is red and his eyes are dilated and his hair is disheveled and tears are flowing down his cheeks and he's saying, it's not fair, it's not fair. What does he mean? He means, I've lost the advantage. Why? Because we have innate senses of fairness. We have innate senses of justice. We have in eight senses of responsibility and culpability. They're all there. Where did they come from? They came from a creator God who is all powerful and all majestic, listen, and is moral. And if this creator God is all moral, now, when he created things the way they ought to be, there was a certain morality. There was responsibility. There was accountability. There was right. And there was wrong. And what happened? The fall. The fall. And nothing is the way it ought to be. 
And if nothing is the way it ought to be, we've got to ask ourselves a question. What does God think about this? What does God think about this? Well, he could say, that's my world. I put human beings in charge. They reneged on their privilege and their responsibility. They traded it for their own independence, and they decided they wanted to be God, and they didn't want to be human. And they rebelled against me, and they took the whole created order down with them, and nothing is the way it ought to be. I've had it with them, and I've had it with the created order. I'm going to wipe it out, and I'll sit down and think for another eternity whether I want to do another one. Could have done that. But he didn't. He didn't. Do you know what he did? He said, that's my world. And those are my people. And they totally blew it. And it breaks my heart. And I cannot turn a blind eye to their rebellion. I cannot turn a blind eye to their rejection. I cannot turn a blind eye to the fact that they wanted to be God and refused to be human. I cannot ignore it. But my problem is this. I am required by my very nature of a just, holy, righteous God to judge them. But here's my dilemma. I love them to distraction. And here's the issue. What on earth can God do about a world where we're all agreed nothing is the way it ought to be. When he totally rejects what we have made it, totally rejects the way we behave, must, because of his righteousness and his holiness and his justice, judge us, and yet at the same time, he loves us. Well, I want to just point you back again to Romans chapter 5. And we're thinking of the dilemma, the divine dilemma. How on the one side, God's holiness, righteousness, and justice demands that he deals with us in righteousness and in justice. And on the other hand, he loves us to distraction. Listen to what it says in verse 7, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. That has the connotation of a self-righteous man. If we see a self-righteous man, do we say, oh, that is such a wonderful man, I would lay down my life for him? Probably not. We don't like self-righteous people very much. Very rarely will anyone die for a, quote, self-righteous man. For a good man... That is, for somebody who is really genuine, helpful, loving, caring, self-sacrificial, a real servant spirit, a boon to the society, a great person for our city. He gets himself into trouble. Yeah, some people would say, I would die for that guy. <laughs> but not all that many. Now, what does he say? Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. There's the demonstration of God's love for this world that we have led into a position where nothing is the way it ought to be. He loves us. And he demonstrates his love for us, all right? Now, here's the other side of the issue. Verse 9, since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? 
God's wrath, God's judgment, God's righteous evaluation of this world where nothing is the way it ought to be has to be factored in. But also, the love that God has for it has to be factored in. How on earth can the righteous holiness of God deal in justice with a fallen humanity that he loves to distraction? How, how would we handle a dilemma like that? I, I tell you how many human beings try to handle a dilemma like that, a moral dilemma. <laughs> do, do you know what we tend to do? We tend to pick one side of the issue and ignore the other one. So God says, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll forget about being holy and righteous and just, and I'll just love them. I'll just, I'll just be a big, warm, cuddly teddy bear of a God, slightly old, losing it just ever so slightly, and I'll just love everybody. <laughs> hey, folks, folks, that is the God of the imagination of millions today. The only problem is this. If God ignores his righteousness and his holiness and his justice, we have no basis for righteousness or for justice. And God ceases to be God. We've got a problem. Oh, well, maybe you'll go the other way. Maybe he'll say, I'm going to be righteous and holy and just, and I'm going to give them what they deserve. Pow! Well, that gets us off the dilemma. The only thing is God is now no longer true to himself. And his integrity is destroyed. We've got a problem. How does God deal with his dilemma? And the answer is very, very simply contained in these incredibly fundamental words. Christ commended his love towards us, demonstrated his own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, the solution to the divine dilemma is the cross. For on the cross, where Jesus died. His love was demonstrated to the nth degree, and his righteous, holy justice was wrought in Christ. Now, people struggle with that, and they say, you know, this idea of my sins being you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. I never claim to be a saint. That's my kind of sin. It, it, does, it does seem that God going to all this trouble about Jesus dying on the cross is a little bit over the top. It's rather like the little boy who said a naughty word one day and his mummy spanked him on his hand and said, that's a naughty word and I don't ever want to hear you say that again and now go to your room. So the little guy toddles off to his room and a little later there's an enormous thunderstorm. Lightning flashing, thunder is rolling and the weather gets a little bit concerned about her little boy so she goes up and the little boy is standing by the window. And he's watching the lightning and he's listening to the thunder and he said it was only one little word. I think God's overreacting <laughs> a little bit. I think God's overreacting a little bit. A lot of people deep down in their hearts think that the cross is God overreacting just a little bit about the things that they've done that they never pretended to be perfect. And Everybody's doing it. The Archbishop of Canterbury in the end of the 11th century was called Bishop Anselm. Bishop Anselm said this, we have not considered what a heavy weight sin 
is. We have not considered what a heavy weight sin is. With all due respect to the Archbishop, I think he's right, but he didn't go far enough. We don't understand the sinfulness of sin. And secondly, we don't understand the holiness of holiness. And because we don't understand the sinfulness of sin, and we don't understand the holiness of holiness, we don't understand the cross. For on the cross, when Christ died for us, which is what Scripture says over and over and over again, we see the love of God demonstrated, and we see the holy, righteous wrath of God poured out for sin. Well, what happened on the cross? Well, Scripture says this. The consequences of sin, which lead to nothing being the way it ought to be. The consequences of sin. That means man's desire to be God, to run their own lives and to put God on the periphery, means that they refuse to be human beings, which means we're created in the divine image to live in a relationship with God that is loving, trusting, and obedient. We don't want to do that. We don't want to be men. We want to be God. That has totally screwed up the whole system, and everything has fallen into fallenness. All right? That is the weight of sin. That is the weight of sin. If we think in terms of that, we recognize that God, because of his very nature, is locked in to being holy and righteous and just, etc., etc. How can our utter sinfulness and God's utter righteousness coexist? And here's the answer. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. If God only had a perfect substitute who for the whole human race could become their representative and that substitute could be judged as a representative of the human race for the sins of the whole world, God could then demonstrate his love for the whole of humanity in utterly and totally forgiving them. If only he had a perfect man who was qualified to die a perfect death, which is the wages of sin, if only. Somebody said to me, why does God only have one way for people to get back to him? Why does he only have one way? Why doesn't he have lots of ways? I think he has lots of ways. I said, I don't agree. Well, he said, why does he only have one? I said, because he could only find one perfect man who could be a perfect substitute, who could be a perfect sacrifice so that God could be in him reconciling the world to himself. Christ died for us the perfect man, who is not only the perfect man, but was God incarnate. And so God says, I will not only be the holy, righteous judge, I will be the loving substitute in Christ. And on the cross, the love of God and the holiness and righteousness and justice of God meet. And you know what happened? We begin to discover the basis upon which men and women can be reconciled to God. Now let me just finish up. I'm going to finish up now. Let me just finish up by reading to you the net results of when people begin to think through, embrace, and trust this message of the cross. These are the results. Verse 9, Romans 5. 
since we have now been justified by his blood. Ponder what that means. That's number one. How much more shall we be saved from wrath? God's wrath. That's number two. Ponder that one. If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to him, reconciled him, that's the third one. Ponder that. How much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? There's number four. Four things that are the results of what God did in Christ if we embrace them and trust ourselves to the work of God in reconciling men and women to himself. What happens? I'm justified by his blood. I'm saved from God's wrath through him. I am reconciled to God, and I will continually be saved by his life. And Paul ends our reading by saying, not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Of course we rejoice. We've been saved from wrath. We've been reconciled to God. We are being saved by his life. And all this because of the forgiveness of sins. Of course we rejoice in God. And we do it in the community of faith when we come together to worship. And we do it when we leave the gathering of worshipers and move out into a world that does not know our Christ and does not honor our God. And there is something so positive and something so winsome and there's something that has a sense of purpose about us that men and women begin to say, what is it makes you tick? And the answer is, how long have you got? <laughs> but let me just explain it to you. Things are not the way they ought to be. But there was a way things ought to be. And God is the one who ordained the way it ought to be, but we rejected it. That's the, way, that's the reason things are not the way they ought to be. But God didn't wipe us off on the map. He set about reconciling the world to himself, and that required a perfect man who was perfect God, dying as our substitute. God was able to judge him. In doing it, he was able to extend his love to us. And guess what? I believe it. And as a result of it, I've committed myself to him. And I just want you to know, I've been reconciled to God. I've been saved from wrath through him. And I've been saved by his life. And so I just get up in the morning and I rejoice in God. Thank you for asking me what makes me tick. I wish you could learn to tick the same way too. God bless you. Thank you.